Hello and welcome to this Risk Management for Pastors webinar. This is part four in our series, a really an introduction to risk management for pastors. My name is David Fournier. I'm the Vice President and uh, Chief Client Care Officer at Adventist Risk Management, the Seventh-day Adventist Church's risk management and insurance company. Thank you for taking the time to spend on the topic of risk management. Um, again, this is really the part four in a series where we have looked at a number of different areas of risk management. The first presentation, the first webinar that we did in this series was really an overview, setting the stage, the tone for why this is important for pastors as we consider the role of risk management in our churches, in our ministry. Uh, then we got into some of the physical plant and life safety issues, uh, child protection, and lastly, what we're looking at today is activity planning and transportation. So many of our ministries really do uh, have some very active um, activities. We go off site, we take our pathfinders camping, we take adventurers out on little field trips. Um, th there's any number of things that maybe we bring in um, some special activity on site to our to our church, to our school. Planning effectively for these different activities is really, really important, uh, especially when it includes our, our young people, but, but certainly for everyone. So we're going to look at a few key areas um, in this short webinar. Certainly we could dive deeper into this topic and we will continue to provide resources and information that allow us to do that. But the tone of these webinars is, again, an introduction and really helping a pastor know what should you be looking for uh, in your congregation, what does success look, look like, what should your pathfinder, your children's ministries, your safety officer, what activities should they be involved in, how can you know if they're doing uh, the right things. So. We're going to look a little bit at, you know, parental consent and release forms. Uh, we'll talk about qualified supervision that continues to be uh, one of the areas that I, I think needs the most emphasis. We talked about that more in the previous webinar, number three. Uh, and we'll talk a lot about safe transportation. Uh, as well as just children in vehicles, uh, parked vehicles, um, transporting them in personal volunteer vehicles, owned vehicles by the church, rented vehicles, all of those ideas. One of the first resources, and I really do want this presentation to be a resource-oriented presentation, uh, one of the primary resources I want to share with you is a a document we created, it's a fillable form, a, a PDF document, uh, that is a planning checklist. And I believe it's actually multiple pages. You see the first page illustrated here. Um, it, the, the trip or off-site activity planning checklist. This is really to help um, whoever is planning an activity walk themselves through all of the elements that should be considered. Uh, you know, whether that's the supervision element, the nature of the vehicles being used, the drivers, um, some insurance questions, uh, a number of really important details uh, so that you are familiar with um, all of the elements of the activity and you're not forgetting an important planning piece. That's free and available on our website. I encourage you to make use of that uh, and encourage your your ministry leaders to make use of that planning checklist. It will help them avoid um, challenges where they might have forgotten a piece in their planning. Uh, I, I, I mentioned last time how uh, amongst our attorneys, as they work to defend the church, there's a common comment made that it's not what we do as a church that gets us in trouble. It's what we don't do. It's, it's the lack in the planning. 
it's the element we missed that will often result in uh, a lawsuit that that doesn't go in our favor um, because it is easy for the the plaintiff to show that we we were negligent we didn't do something that we should have done we had a duty to do something and, and we didn't do it uh, so using effective planning helps us get past that and and helps us to have really positive and effective uh, activities where people can enjoy and experience what they're there to experience without fear of injury and uh, perhaps bad memories later. So let's look at um, the consent and re medical release forms. Most likely your conference organization has an approved um, consent form that they have created. They've run this past their uh, legal counsel, your legal counsel. Um, you are the conference. So I encourage you to use that. ARM also develops uh, sort of template models of these kinds of forms that we are happy to share uh, with you as well. But if your conference does have one that they have settled on, um, please use the conference form uh, from your conference office. Uh, so what are these trying to achieve? It, some, some people look at a medical release form, emergency medical, um, as sort of a get out of jail free card. You know, it's, it's this release. Well, they knew what they were getting into. And so, you know, they were hurt and that's not our problem anymore because they signed a release. And unfortunately, these forms are not, not, quite, that, um, not quite that effective. They're not going to be a get out of jail free card um, document. However, they are important as a communication tool. And it is again, one of those things that are, it's the bare minimum of what you should, you should be doing. And you should be working really hard to make sure that the release forms you're using are actually effective and the language on them is up to date. Um, one of the areas that I really want to highlight is uh, the second major bullet point here, be specific to the activities. A release form is going to be much, much more effective for you if you have put on the form very specifically the activities that are actually taking place. Uh, this is not an area to be broad and vague of, uh, we will go on field trip. No, uh, no, no, no. Where are you going on the field trip? When are you going on the field trip? What is happening on the field trip? Are people swimming? Are they doing, you know, visiting with um, a petting zoo? Uh, you know, are there going to be, what kind of animals are at that petting zoo? Um, be very, very specific. And then also very important, if you're going to be disclosing, here's exactly the kinds of things we will be doing that parents authorize that, that you don't then change the plan. Uh, sometimes we, we, you know, we're coordinating an activity, we make our plans, we have people sign off on an activity, and then later on that falls through and we, we change the plans. Well, we're not going swimming, so we're going to go rock climbing. Wow. Um, first of all, rock climbing not automatically covered by your insurance package if, if you're insured. Uh, through the church's insurance program, um, and and not to be assumed with other carriers either, and uh, you know that takes a whole different skill set. It takes a whole different planning of you know do we have the right kind of supervision, the right type of equipment, is it properly covered by insurance? There's a lot of things that need to be thought through there before we go ahead and change the plan. Not to mention the fact that a parent who has signed off on their child doing one activity may not be comfortable with their child doing the other activity at all. So be very specific and then make sure that it is true to what's actually happening. You'll want to clearly identify potential hazards, uh, make sure that it is signed by the appropriate party. I have heard of um, ministry leaders who have actually signed off on forms for the parent. 
So they, they understood at least that the documentation was necessary, uh, but they've completely made, made these forms useless by signing off on them on behalf of the parents. That, that has accomplished very little, if, if not uh, actually made things worse. So it, it's very important that the actual authority, whether that's a parent or the official guardian of the child, signs off on the waiver. Uh, and then also, it's important that these forms um, be made available uh, and, and are, are being held and kept in appropriate ways. What do we mean by that? Um, I've heard of some conferences who've developed policies where these forms are so carefully protected because they might have you know, personal medical information on them that no one can access them. So in the event of a child, you know, experiencing an allergy or uh, having an injury and you need to know the information that's on the form, uh, you know, that they're locked in a safe back at the church, uh, you know, hours away. Well, that's not helpful uh, once that's taken place. Very, very important that the information is kept secure but accessible uh, for those who need it. The reason a parent tells you that their child has uh, you know, an allergy or some sort of medical condition is so that you will use good judgment uh, related to that information. Uh, and if you don't readily have that information, and if you don't use that information, uh, they will be more likely to want to hold you accountable for what you didn't do. Um, we have had some interesting cases where um, you know, a parent has said, well, my child has this condition, and um, so they require to have, let's say, refrigerated, you know, medication, um, and I want you to make sure that my child participates in absolutely every single activity, even if, even if, if the um, condition really precludes the ability for us to uh, manage that, that scenario. Uh, we can't we can't bring a cooler <laughs> with this medication to where we're going, uh, not how we're getting there anyway. So it's important to have those honest conversations up front, so that a child is is really uh, protected throughout the process. You want to make them your first priority. Uh, their safety and uh, their experience uh, needs to be positive. So that's, that's really what these consent forms are all about. It's about documenting um, relevant information and then making sure we're actually using that information uh, effectively to protect our, our children and our, all of our participants. So let's keep going here. Let's look at uh, a few items that we need to be thinking about. These would often appear again on our checklist. Um, what vehicles are we using? Are, are we getting... Um, are volunteers going to be driving people in their personal vehicles? Do they understand that when it comes to automobiles and auto insurance, automobiles, the, the insurance follows the vehicle. So that person's primary auto policy will be primary um, in the event of an accident. So it's important that they have effective limits in place uh, because now they may be carrying around several other other people. If if they're in a terrible accident and those people are injured or or even worse, um, how effective is their auto policy going to be to respond to that incident? Um, the church may still be held accountable in excess of that uh, primary policy, but it would be in excess of that. So many conferences actually have a minimum limit that, that they require any volunteer who's driving on their behalf has. And as a pastor, I would encourage you to uh, consider that, be familiar with what that limit is. You may need to call and ask your risk manager or treasurer at your conference to know what the limit is at that conference. Um, so, and, and I would encourage, you know, a robust limit to be selected for that. Um, if, 
your large organization is asking someone to drive on your behalf and, and there's a loss, the amount of money that's going to be uh, demanded is going to be quite, quite high. And most people's typical limits are going to be grossly inadequate to respond to that kind of a claim. I think you understand what I'm, what I'm driving at there. The other thing that other things that we do need to consider is whatever vehicle, whether it's a rented vehicle, whether it's you know volunteers vehicles, or an owned vehicle, we really need to be sure that you know this is a good vehicle, that it's it's not something that's about to fall apart. It's being uh, maintained correctly. It has all of the proper restraints, and you don't have more people than seat belts in that vehicle. Um, you want to consider emergency equipment. Um, you know, again, we, we may sometimes take certain risks personally, um, where we might not have an emergency kit in the car. Um, but we are now operating on behalf of a very large organization. And we have other people entrusted into our care, custody and control. So having emergency kits, having a plan, and carefully monitoring whether this is an effective vehicle and are these good effective drivers? Is this person properly licensed for the type of vehicle that they're driving? Uh, do they have a very good reputation? Are they a qualified person to be driving um, on our behalf? Very, very important for us to consider. You may want to make sure that there are effective communication tools. I I can remember back in uh, my academy days, you know, choir trips, got, getting out on the road, uh, multiple uh, vans. And yes, back in those days, we were driving around in 15 passenger vans. Uh, and we often, I have to say, experienced some sort of a breakdown or other. And one vehicle is left by the side of the road. Um, so do we have effective mechanisms to communicate uh, with the other parties? Today, this seems a fairly, um, a fairly reasonable expectation. Most people carry a cell phone, but let's be sure. And let's be sure we actually have each other's numbers and can do, you know, call uh, whoever we need to call. Uh, the other piece that really needs to be highlighted when we're looking at particularly the transportation issue, um, and certainly the the activity planning as well, is that we actually have effective child to staff ratios. Uh, last year, I had the opportunity to speak at a, the summit on abuse where I presented a, a topic on child on child, child to child abuse scenarios. And we looked at a number of representative case studies that were directly from our files of abuse taking place. And uh, at least one of the scenarios we looked at in that presentation had to do with abuse that actually took place on a, on a trip. It was a group of pathfinders traveling in a bus. Uh, they had rented a bus. And so that, that abusive activity took place on the bus. So my question is what was happening with the supervision on that activity or on that trip. Uh, obviously the, the driver can't be responsible for monitoring what's taking place in the back seat. Well, somebody has to be able to do that. And it requires an adult who is present, who is also paying attention, who understands the dynamics of the group and is taking appropriate action to make sure that this group is supervised effectively. Adventist Risk Management also has another tool that really helps with just a vehicle pre-trip -ins pre inspection. And, and we actually encourage you, maybe consider doing this before and after a trip. Um, this is just a real quick physical check. Idea is your tire pressure where it needs to be, fluid levels where they need to be. Belts and hoses in good condition. You know, are all of your lights working effectively? It's amazing. You drive down the highway and you see folks with you know one headlight on on a regular basis. Well, um, really good idea to make sure that your 
church organization, when you're planning your trips, you're not working with uh, faulty or defective um, vehicles and really avoid those adventures by the side of the road. Um, I, I was told a story of a church group that actually broke down on one of the major bridges in New York City. So there they are. These are absolutely miserable to cross at the best of times. High traffic, just clogged right up. And you can only imagine what it's like when when you were to break down in the middle of that and then need, you know, to call for assistance and and, and get towed. Not to mention now you have all of these people in the vehicle who, who need to be cared for. They need to be... Um, picked up and carried in uh, another vehicle. So let's avoid those kinds of scenarios entirely by actually making sure that the vehicles we're using are in good shape ahead of time. I mentioned 15 passenger vans and you knew I'd get to this uh, topic point here eventually. Uh, here on the screen right now is the current policy, uh, the North American Division's policy about 15 passenger vans. And it's very clear, in the interest of safety, denominational organizations shall not purchase, lease, rent, or use 15 passenger vans under any circumstances. Uh, and then they list some alternatives, uh, which, are, which are good and effective alternatives. I want you to think for a moment that we have lost a number of lives in a number of different incidents with these vans. Uh, we know better. We know that they're not safe. We know that we have actually experienced the losses. We have seen similar organizations to ours also experience the same types of losses. Uh, these are not a good solution for our congregations. Some of our um, members have taken the approach of uh, borrowing or, um, you know, giving the, the van to a church member who then makes it available for, for the church to use, thinking that somehow they've, they've solved the problem. Um, that is a terrible conclusion to make, uh, because the church will still be held accountable for that activity, even if it's borrowed or rented. Uh, it's not only the owned vans that represent a risk to the church. It's any use, any use of a van. So, not to mention the fact that you have now put the person who does own the van um, at incredible risk as well, because they would be primary on that. Um, they typically don't carry very significant limits. And in fact, if a judgment comes down, they, they may find that their personal assets are at stake as well, all because they were trying to do their local church a favor. Um, so I really encourage you, do not allow anyone in your church to use any 15 passenger vans for any reason at all. I do recognize that understanding what is a 15 passenger van and what isn't a 15 passenger van can be uh, quite a bit more complex than we would prefer. Uh, I wish it was a simple and easy thing to, to figure out. However, there are 12 passenger vans that are really 15 passenger vans that have been reconfigured either by the manufacturer or in you know aftermarket customization with only 12 seats. So the term 15 passenger van does lend itself to some confusion. Here's my rule of thumb way of figuring this out because I do get a lot of um, emails and calls uh, asking, hey, can you help me figure out is this a 15 passenger van or not? My rule of thumb is this, if it could be configured as a 15 passenger van, let's not use it. That is a 15 passenger van, okay? So if it could be, then let's not use it. And there are different wheelbases and total lengths depending on year, manufacturer. There's great deal of variables that we could dig into to try to determine you know, what it exactly is that we're dealing with. 
what I would encourage you to do is steer clear of, of anything that could be a 15 passenger van and pursue completely different solutions, whether that is the minivans or SUVs, um, school buses, or the 15 passenger buses with dual rear wheels. Um, I, again, probably more of a confusing concept than a helpful one, but there are um, buses that have been reinforced. They have the dual rear wheels. There are some of those. If you've traveled to and from an airport where they have, you know, the off-site um, parking or rental car center, you've often traveled in one of those 15 passenger buses with the dual rear wheels. Um, something to explore if you need exactly that type of, of solution. For some have thought that just removing some seats in the van, you know, maybe now it only has 12 seats. So now it's a 12 passenger van. It's still the same uh, type of van. You still have exactly the same length, the same height. Um, the, the problems of weight distribution are still very, very similar. So do not make that excuse or, or that assumption. Um, removing a row of seats does not make it a different type of vehicle. Um, and then we've, we've talked about this already a little bit. Please do not assume that just because you're using a van that's privately owned, your church won't be held accountable. Not only will you be, or the, the owner be held accountable, the church will eventually be held accountable as well. As the lawsuits are looking for the deep pockets, it's going to come to the church's door and the church will have responsibility if you know it was our activity we will get looped into it um, if if it was our activity uh, we should be planning uh, effective events and effective activities that do not include uh, 15 passenger vans so we need to plan proactively effective and good transportation solutions and and that does not include 15 passenger vans that really concludes what i wanted to share with you today about activity planning my challenge and my uh, my my conclusion is please work with your conference whether it's on the um release forms the medical release forms the activity release forms um, your conference's policy on, you know, whether their employees or volunteers need to have certain limits on their insurance if they're going to be using it on behalf of church activities. Um, please stand firm against the, uh, you know, people using vehicles that should not be used, uh, whether they're just in disrepair, they're poorly maintained, they have bald tires please choose and, and select effective and good solid drivers who will use good judgment in the decisions they make as they're carrying our, our precious cargo about. So thank you for the leadership you provide, making this a priority in your church uh, so that the memories we create for our members, for our visitors are ones that are positive and point to Christ rather than our uh, tragedy or a matter of disappointment where we think the church should have and could have done better. So thank you for your leadership in that area. As we close, I just wanted to mention one last time, really the quick start, you know, the what we're hoping you will achieve in your local church in the area of risk management in 2018. Make sure that you have a designated safety officer. Uh, if, if applicable in your church, a safety committee to support the work of safety across multiple ministries. Um, make sure your maintenance is up to speed and is being done proactively rather than reactively. And while March 24 has passed, um, if you haven't already done a drill or even if you have, perhaps you could schedule another emergency drill uh, again within 2018. We really want to see every congregation engaged in effective emergency planning so that you will know what to do in an emergency 
before one takes place. Um, trying to figure out what the best course of action during a real emergency will often result in chaos. Also complete at least one self-inspection before July 30 of this year. This is an area where most of our conferences have are going to start checking to see in their local church audit process, are the churches electing a safety officer? Do you have a 15 passenger van? And have you done uh, self-inspection? So go ahead and get that process started. Again, free resources on our website for that. Uh, your safety officer can probably get that done uh, in an afternoon for most locations uh, or even less than an afternoon. So the very last item here we have is reviewing and ensuring that your Pathfinder club safety guidelines are within local conference guidelines. Make sure that everybody on the team is up to speed on that, that safety and risk management is a priority of those leading out in that area. Uh, especially as we start planning for next year and the International Campery in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. So uh, we look forward to seeing you there. We want the trip that our Pathfinder clubs take to Oshkosh to be one that is memorable because of the positives and not because of some unfortunate uh, incident that takes place at the Campery or uh, in the travel to and from that takes careful planning and we want to start that process now. So thank you. I appreciate uh, all that each of you do. And my challenge is to partner with us as you lead in the area of risk management in your church.